Good morning, everyone. Welcome to you all. Christ is risen. Christ is risen. Christ is risen. Christ is risen. Yes. Lord Jesus, you are risen indeed, the King of the cosmos, alive, alive, forever alive, sins forever alive. We're here to worship you on the first Sunday after this wonderful, this mysterious day when we realise that there is no way that you could ever be dead. There is no way that you could ever be absent. You are here. We are with you forever in your presence. And we're here today to worship again, to reset ourselves to a new beginning, growing into a deeper awareness of what it means that you are indeed alive and well, alive and kicking, as we are newborn babes in Christ. We pray today that all that we do here in our worship time together, will give you glory and will give us a glimpse of who you really are, of how close, how alive you are, of your grace forever and ever. And we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, the risen Lord. Amen. So we're starting a new series that is really, obviously, a continuation from our Lent series. So we're now practicing resurrection. What does it mean to live as people of the risen Christ? We're going to be singing a couple of songs that uh, all seem very, very familiar. We're going to start with the first one, and I, 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 for one, get them mixed up because they're all so similar. What have we got? We've got, he lives, we've got, because he lives, we've got, he is alive. You get the idea. So now let us start with joyful worship. Please stand and we sing together the first song and the title I've already forgotten because they're all so similar. He lives. <laughs> we thank you. You are here. And whatever happens, you are here. We are in your presence together as your beloved people. Today is a day of new beginning, a first opportunity to celebrate where you are taking us. And we may not know exactly where it's going. We may not know exactly what we ought to be doing, just like now when we didn't quite know what to sing. But then, but then, there were moments where we knew what was happening. We trust you, God. 
And we may not remember how it came about that we have this trust in you, but we do. And we thank you that you're giving us all these many, many ways of knowing somehow that you are real. Thank you so, so much. Amen. And if you want to jump up again, we're going to sing again. He is Lord. Do we have the slides? Yay! <laughs> Let's sing, friends. for communion but first a little thought it was a roller coaster ride like no other you should have been there maybe in some way we all were I know I was in some way there that Thursday evening when we sat down with Jesus when he instituted this very thing we're about to do when he wait for it washed our feet when he predicted that someone would betray him and that someone else would deny him three times oh what a roller coaster ride and then we headed out to the garden well shame of shame we couldn't even stay awake while in his agony he prayed And that was those of us who hadn't even run away. Because many of us did that. And Lord, you know the agony you went through there and the agony you went through on that Friday when they tortured you, they beat you, they nailed you to that cross. Roller coaster ride doesn't go to explain it. It was just awful. It was, yes, God awful that day. How can we cope with that? But we did, somehow, because, well, we had our own shame for abandoning him. We had beautiful memories of him. And then it was Passover and we couldn't do anything. But then the roller coaster ride continued on that Sabbath day and then after, on the resurrection morning as we now call it, when we discovered something awesome, frightening, too much to bear. At first, it was terrible. The tomb was empty. What? Who would do a thing like that? Take him away. Oh. And then some among us, Mary first and then others, claimed to have seen 
Jesus alive. What? You know? None of us remembered that Jesus himself had predicted this very thing and said he must die and he must, he would rise. Well, yes, the inevitable little story. It's a quick one. It's an Easter, post-Easter Sunday in Canada when a Sunday school gathered and there was this little group of varied ages and they were divided up into their age groups and there were about 13 80-year-olds. And uh, their creative teacher had created for each of them a little papier-mâché tomb. And they were given this and they were to go out into the gardens with the church and they were to find something in that garden to put in the tomb to represent what happened at Easter. And they went and did that and then they were to bring them back and put them on the table for the teacher, the very creative and smart teacher, to check out what the kids had brought, you know. And someone had brought a dead butterfly and someone brought some seeds and you know the kind of thing. Anyway, then one was there and there was nothing in it. And one child said, oh, it'll be Philip, because he was a little disabled boy who was in their midst. He was very much loved and accepted, but sometimes I teased him a bit when he apparently got things wrong, you know. It must have been Philip. Philip, did you put in something in your tomb, or did you just hand in an empty one? It was me, Philip said. And yes, I put it in like that. Well, Philip, you got it wrong, said one of the boys. I did not get it wrong. It was empty. The tomb was empty. And Philip got it right of them all. He could see the truth of that, that the tomb was empty. That beautiful truth, that it was empty and first frightening, as I said, they were terrified of what might have happened to it, to the body, and then they saw Jesus and they knew. Well, now we're back at the Thursday night when Jesus sat down with his friends and he took some bread, having given thanks. And he broke the bread and gave it to them all, saying, Take, eat. Let this remind you of my body broken for you. For the forgiveness of your sins. And then after supper he took the cup and again giving thanks. He gave it to them saying drink from this all of you. For this is my blood of the new covenant. Broken, given for you. For the forgiveness of all your sins. Do this whenever you drink it in memory of me. And my friends in Christ, that's what we're doing right now. In memory of Christ's death and resurrection, by the way. So if the service would come forward, please. And while they come forward and take their elements, just to remind you that it is the Lord's table, it's not the table of living faith church, it's the Lord Jesus who invites us. And so everyone is invited to this table. Please take. When you receive, you can take a piece of bread and a little glass 
The piece of bread you may eat when it's the right time for you to do that. Straight away, if you like. But the glass, if you hold on to it, please, and we will drink it all together. So, this is the body of Christ, broken for you. The blood of Christ poured out to the last drop for you. So we drink together to remind us that Jesus poured out his blood and allowed his body to be broken for us, for the world, that we might have life in all its fullness. Let's drink all together. So let us pray. We thank you, Lord, for this beautiful, bewildering, yet wonderful and beautiful story. We thank you that when we thought it had ended, it was only the beginning. And that beginning continued and continues today in us, in all those who call you Lord. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Our first reading comes from 1 Peter, chapter 1, verses 22, chapter 20, chapter 2, verse 3. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for each other, love one another deeply from the heart. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. For all people are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord endures forever, and this is the word that was preached to you. Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice and all... We come now to our community news. The first item that I've got on the slide, if we could go to that. Uh, nominations are now open for applications for the role of elder. Uh, application packs are now available. They're at the, right at the back there. On the, we've got some on the table. Please consider whether God is leading you into this ministry. It's an important ministry for our church and uh, we invite you to prayerfully consider whether this is a role that you could do. We've got uh, three of our elders who are completing their terms and are eligible to renominate, but we've also got a couple of other vacancies. So please consider that. Uh, nominations will close on the 21st of April and the election will be either late May or early June. Uniting Church Safe Church Training is now available online. So if you missed out on doing Safe Church Training and you'd like to do it, all you need to do is to contact admin at livingfaithchurch.org.au to find out how to register and you can uh, update your Safe Church Training. So just, that's just for anybody who uh, hasn't done it but who would, thinks that they would like to do it because we do uh, encourage everybody to do safe church training and to have working with children checks because uh, we value our safe environment here at Living Faith Church. 
Ladies' Night Out is on Tuesday the 16th of April uh, at Montmorency RSL uh, for 6pm. So uh, contact uh, Leanne or Kay if uh, you are interested in going to that. Rosters for May and June. If you're not available for roster duties in May or June, uh, please notify Joan by next Sunday. Spiritual practices is ongoing and Ellen's been taking these uh, evening sessions. Uh, there are still ongoing times, Thursday 16th of May, 15th of August, 12th of October and 14th of November. I think those dates will be in getting connected, so please uh, see Ellen to find out more. And if you'd like to connect with us at Living Faith Church, we'd love to receive your email to welcome at livingfaithchurch.org.au. And of course, uh, as always, we invite people to come and pray, uh, have prayer if they would like at the end of the service. There will be people here to pray with you whether you are wanting personal prayer, you would like to pray for somebody or to pray for God's kingdom, you are welcome to come to the front at the end of the service to receive prayer. We're now going to have a video clip. Backgrounds, profession and experiences that he has provided for us. So I have been a cancer immunologist and God has led me to move from Western medicine to herbal medicines to look at how different cultures, those plants and fruits that were able to enhance our immunity. So I have opportunity to help those communities from different cultures, from India, from China, from Middle East, and also Australian indigenous community. And God further led me to focus on the Australian indigenous herbal medicines, those plants and those fruits that the Australian indigenous elders, they came to me to help them to choose which plant to develop into health products. During the Melbourne COVID lockdown, God's word came to me. Daniel is not just about concerning their health and wealth of the indigenous community, but it is about their whole being, their spiritual need, and to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. So I'm here and ready to serve and give the gospel to the First Nation people. And I invite many others I call Third Nations Christian Churches to join with me. We are indigenous people back in our own land. I'm from Hong Kong, China. You may be from other countries. We are Christian, we are followers of Jesus, and God brought us across the ocean, and now we are in Australia. And I believe that God will call some of us we would serve and reach out to the First Nations people in here. I'm looking forward to churches, to groups, and individuals to partnering with me in this First Nations gospel ministry in urban and in regional Australia. I need the support, the prayers from you. Thank you for joining with me. Any one of you recognise Daniel? You've seen a video of him a while ago. So this is just a brief update. Daniel is a missionary, as he said, to Aboriginal communities here in, in the northern part of our continent. And when we celebrated Christmas together with Agape Church, the offering that we took on that day went to Daniel. So this video is just a way to keep Daniel on our minds and to let you all know that his work continues. Thank you.
We come now to our transformative prayers and your responses will be on the screen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we bring to you now our prayers for the world, for your church and your people. Lord, we pray for our world, ravaged by war, famine, Lord, we often don't know what we can do as individuals, but if each of us prays, if each of us does what we can do, together we can make a difference. So, Lord, we bring before you the rulers of our nations and those who can make decisions that will change the way things are in the world. Loving God in your mercy. Lord, we pray for your church that wherever people gather to worship you, that your word will be preached, that your word will become real to those who hear your word. We pray for this congregation as we seek a minister for the word. Lord, that you will fill our church with the people that you want us to have. So help us as we go through the process of seeking a new minister, uh, be with the church council and the presbytery members who are helping us in this. Loving God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for our community, that we might be able to go out and transform people's lives by the way we act, the way we the things we say, the things we do. It's not us transforming, but you transforming people. But Lord, we can make a difference to our community. So help us, we pray. Loving God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, there are people who are not well, who are sick, people that we know in our congregation who are unwell. Lord, in this moment of silence, we bring before you those people on our hearts and minds at this time. Loving God, in your mercy, we bring you these prayers in the name of Jesus and together we say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We're going to sing again while our offering is being collected. If you haven't brought an offering today or you're a visitor, feel free to let the offering bowl pass. If you've already... Uh, contributed by electronic funds transfer. Again, just let the bowl pass. But we're going to sing again. And what's the song, Ellen?
Because he lives. Because he lives, we can face tomorrow. assurance of things hoped for. And so in faith, with assurance, we give our money this morning. We hope in a generous God who meets our needs. We hope in a creative God who multiplies our gifts. We hope in a mysterious God who invites us to kingdom living. God of grace, accept these gifts and us in your service. Amen. Our second reading comes from John chapter 21. Verses 1 to 14. Afterwards, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them. And they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realise that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, 
it is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off, and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about a hundred metres. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have just caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153, but even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. I'm Ellen, by the way, without the name tag. <laughs> I keep doing that and I apologise. I keep forgetting to introduce myself and that's rude. Um, we are starting this new series that we've called Practicing Resurrection. And obviously, it's a follow-on from the Easter story and Lent that we have all celebrated together. So I'll give you a very short overview of this series and I'll say one or two things about it before I jump into the first part that we're going to be looking at today. We have Six weeks. You notice that the last number down there is seven. That's because the first one is two and not one. <laughs> there are different ways of counting the Sundays after Easter. Sometimes Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday is considered to be number one. Sometimes it is considered number zero. So um, for us, it's number one. So we are going to be looking at these themes. Newborn babies, newborn children, that's today. Filled with praise. Singing of grace, life song from the heart, and learning the way. Now, there is not obviously a particular connection between those, but I want to give you a little bit of background. So in the tradition that I have sort of grown up in, you know that I was not born into a Christian family, but I grew up in, in a cultural Christian um, context. And the Sundays of Easter, the ones between Sunday and Pentecost, in a particular tradition in the Christian faith, all have their own name. And they all center around the theme of joy, of praise to God because of Easter. And we're following this quirky tradition from a tiny part of our faith, and it comes to you through me. So um, there is a little bit of background in getting connected as well. Have a look at that. And if you've got any questions about it, please talk to me. I'd love these sorts of conversations. So today we are looking at practicing resurrection like newborn children. And we're going to mess with the timeline just a little bit, and we're going all the way back to the beginning. In the beginning, please continue this sentence. Ah, yes, exactly. There is that one. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was from God. Exactly, and God was this Word. There is another beginning. In the beginning, God create exactly, right? So two ways that take us back to where it all started in the grand scheme of things. And we're going to do the same again, but we're looking a bit closer to us as individuals. So what the Bible tells us, and ye to those who got the John beginning right, we read that the word was there something that is spoken, something you can hear. And there was life because of that. The 
the light was stronger than the darkness. And the people got to see this glory in the person of Jesus once the word had become flesh. And even though no one had ever and cannot ever see God, the Son, Jesus, is making God known. So what John is doing here in the opening of his gospel, and the end of it is what we just heard, he puts the whole story in this context of light and darkness and of seeing and hearing. You've got the word, and then the word becomes seeable. So the primary sense that we get here of how we can recognize Jesus is vision. People saw God in the form of Jesus. Just keep that on the back burner because we will be talking about what it is like to be a newborn child. So messing with the timeline, if you want to close your eyes for this little exercise, you may very well do so. I would like you to cast your minds back to about three, maybe four months before you were born. <laughs> Got that? Okay, good. What was your world like? Dark, black, yes. Noisy? Did you just say noisy? Squeezy, yes. Yeah, round. Dark. So what about your sense of vision? What did you see? Not much at all, exactly. But what else were you able to notice? And how? You could hear, yes. What did you hear? The heartbeat, yes. The heartbeat of the living human whose life was your life. So we've got hearing. What else? You said it was squeezy. How would you know? Well, you can feel it, right? There isn't a lot of room. You can, you can feel it because you've got a sense of, you know, we can notice pressure from the outside. You can, you can feel your clothes as you sit. You can tell the difference between wearing a long sleeve or a short sleeve because you can, your, your skin gives you an idea of what's happening around you. So you've got that sense of noticing your environment as it touches your skin. What else was there? It was wet. It is warm. Yes, exactly. And again, it's your skin that tells you about the temperature. You can taste. What can you taste? Whatever is in there, right? Because it's wet. Yeah? Yeah? Yes? You sort of eat your own poop. I know, people. Relax. The, what's it called? Amniotic fluid? Is that, is that the correct term? Yes. The, the water of life that, that gives you life, that is not just outside of you, that is within you, right? So we've got a sense of taste. We've got a sense of hearing. We've got a sense of touch through the skin. That's quite a lot, isn't it? And then go forward a little bit to the moment just after you were born. How about your vision? How good is a baby's sense of vision? Not too good, right? Yes. Yes, you might have heard that even after several weeks. A baby's vision is, is good enough for them to notice a face, you know, that sort of distance, 30, 40 centimetres, that's, that's as good as it gets. Vision is one of the last senses to fully develop. But can you still hear? Oh, yes, absolutely. Um, can you taste? Oh, yes, absolutely. Can you feel, touch? Yes. Yes, you feel between snack on the bottom and cry.
let's hope that no one ever experiences that. <laughs> yeah, so the gentlest touch you will be able to tell. So we actually have a whole range of different senses that tell us about the world that we live in. The Bible is telling us to go back to the very beginning and to encounter the risen Christ like newborn children. And what I would like to highlight is that this actually starts before we're fully aware, before we're born into this new world. There is already the beginning of a whole range of ways in which we can tell what's happening around us. So, I'm going to jump over this one. How do we recognize the one? And let's start by talking about how does a newborn baby recognize the ones who keep it alive? How can you tell who to trust? Well, you can smell. You will smell your mother, your father, whoever is there looking after you. You can tell from the smell of their sweat, for example, that yes, this is the right one. You can hear them. And we know that newborn babies can very easily tell the difference between their own mother's voice and some other voice. They will be able to identify the father's voice, whoever was there during the pregnancy, because they've heard it before. Even though it was filtered through the skin of the mother, they can tell. You can taste the milk that the newborn babies drink, and we've, we've heard about that from Peter. They, that tells a baby that they're in the right place. So when babies start to trust, they have a whole lot to go on. We know. We have already learned how to tell because we've got all of these senses. That's where it all starts. So recognizing Jesus as the one, how can that happen? Let's look at some of the stories of the Easter morning and what happened since then when people met, came across the risen Jesus. What were some of their reactions? Surprise, Surprise yes. How quick were people to recognize Jesus? Nah, took a while, right? It did. So here's Mary, and we think that, that Mary really had a, had a very strong spiritual connection with Jesus. She doesn't recognize Jesus. She thinks it's a gardener. And it's not until he says her name that oh, all of a sudden she realizes that she is, in fact, in the presence of Jesus. So vision doesn't seem to cut it. The story of Thomas Thomas had not been there the first time that Jesus burst into the room where some of his disciples were gathered. They had all seen him and they had all gone, yes, this is Jesus, wonderful. And then they told Thomas about it, but Thomas went like, friends, nah, uh, I, I can't just take your word for that. I need to know in a different way. And what was it that did the trick for him? Touch, exactly. The wounds on Jesus' hands, feet, the wound on his side. He had to literally put his hand there. He had to touch. For him, it was touch. And we've got the disciples. Just then, we heard the story. What was going on there? What was Jesus doing to let them know? who he was. He was making breakfast. 
<laughs> we had the verse very briefly where it said, and you will know how good God is because you can taste it. Isn't it interesting how John, in how he tells the story, gives us several examples of our human senses other than just seeing that allow people to recognize Jesus. I find this very, very encouraging because we all have more than one perceptual channel of recognizing what's going on around us, of recognizing people. For some of us, seeing is the dominant way in which we can recognize another person. But you all know that if you sit at home on the sofa and someone walks down the corridor to the toilet, you can tell from the sound of the footsteps who it is. Yeah? Super easy. You can tell who it is by the, the, the sound of a voice. Obviously, you can. And if something goes wrong, if you're on a bad phone connection, you might not recognize the voice. We have our, uh, our senses of, of touch, even smell, um, that allow us to recognize who is there with us. I can tell the difference between my two daughters by feeling their hair. I can tell. <laughs> Don't ask me how. But somehow I know. And I think this is really, really good news. Because we are not all the same. The fact that there are different stories of how people recognize Jesus tells me that that is a truth. It's not going to be the same for all of us. We all have a very particular and unique combination of how to perceive. And that's there for a reason. In his letters, Paul, every now and then, speaks about the diversity that there is. The different members of the body. None are the same. And all are good and right and all belong and all need to be taken seriously. One spirit, so many different gifts. What are these gifts there for, if not, to give us a sense that yes, it is true. Yes, we can trust God is God and God is good. I found um, this image a bit tricky um, to see. I'll spell it out for you. So in the middle it says... Multiple intelligences, different, different word for ways to understand and make sense of what is happening to you, what comes from the outside. So let's start in, in the top and go around clockwise. There is what they call body smart. So for some of us, knowing who we are and responding to the world around us, experiencing joy, for example, has to do with our own body. Maybe if you dance, if you exercise and you get your heart rate up, maybe that gives you a real sense of, oh, yes, I am, and this is good for me. The next one down, people smart. Maybe for you, a life-giving situation is one where you can connect with other people, where you can hear someone else, where you can be heard. Maybe that's for you. The next one down, the orange one, that says word smart. Maybe language, hearing, speaking, reading, understanding through language is what gives you a sense of deeply connected with God, with whatever else. And for someone else, you go, oh, I don't, language, just, ugh, no. I'm married to a mathematician. For James, words, it, <laughs> Yeah, okay, it works, but it's not really where, where he is. The next one, that is really, if I dare take that example for James, that is how he connects, how he understands and how he makes meaning. Logic smart, they call it. Seeing the patterns, understanding structures, being able to predict what's going to happen next. That is where people like James get a sense of, I'm in the right place. This is good. This is where I belong. The next one says, nature smart. I don't think I need to say much about that, but for many, many people, 
getting a sense of peace, of joy, has to do with being out in the natural world, sitting under a tree, right? Then we have the self, smart, that's the yellow. Maybe you are the sort of person who has a deep sense of God's presence when you shut your eyes, close your ears if you can, and go inside to discover what's in there. And the last two, picture smart. Paintings, colours, maybe that's, that's it for you. And maybe your channel, the last one, is music. And quite certainly, for everyone in this room, anyone who's watching, it's a combination of all of those. So why do we have them? If not, to be able to recognise God. To be able to say that, yes, it is true. I know I know in my bones I can trust like a newborn child. So when you found the one, then you can trust. And like a newborn child, to trust might not mean anything but simply to ask to be looked after by this one. That's as simple as it is for a newborn child, isn't it? Just Please be there. Please look after me so I can live. This is the promise. The promise is life. And a life that is good and colourful and wide and interesting. That is what we're heading towards. And Jesus, as the one who we can trust, will lead us into this, into a life of abundance. So how do you best notice God? I encourage you, I so very much encourage you to notice and to take serious what you know about yourself. What of the things in the world gives you joy? What are you drawn to? I'm the sort of person who likes to touch. I like, I like to feel different textures. I love particular types of colours. And that tells me that I have an entry point into an experience of goodness when I use these particular senses. And I encourage you to do that too. Find what it is that lets you perceive the joy and the goodness that is there waiting for you. And again, the stories that the Bible tells us are encouragements. Mary needed to hear. Thomas needed to feel, to touch. The unnamed people who were walking to Emmaus, they needed to see Jesus do a particular action and then they realised who Jesus was. And the disciples... They heard a voice, and then they were served breakfast. Such a diversity. So let us all take this invitation to be like newborn children seriously and go into that new beginning with an awareness that we are all invited to see and feel and taste and hear how good God really is. Amen. And we conclude our time of worship with another song. We sing about the one in whom we trust. Thank you.
So let us go into this world that surrounds us, reborn as children of God, ready to recognize the one who gives us life. Amen.